Anybody want yeah, the barber chair? I don't know about this. I think I've forgotten my lines. <laughs> Isn't that that dream everybody has? Your the actors have. They get on stage and I don't know what play it is. I don't know. I don't know this. At least I can't remember my living room. Welcome well, back to Kansas City. Indeed. Thank you. Indeed. Well, it's, uh, I haven't been here since 1978, and uh, here I am. Well, we're virtually into it, so I will try to be uh, quite brief. My name is Chuck Berg, and I'm Director of Film Studies at the University of Kansas over in Lawrence. And it is a great pleasure uh, that the uh, task uh, fell on my shoulders to uh, have not only the privilege, but indeed the honor of introducing uh, Mr. Robert Altman and also Mr. Stephen Altman. Both of these gentlemen uh, have been intimately involved in the production that I'm sure most of you have seen recently, Vincent and Theo. And uh, they are here to uh, respond to uh, questions, queries, probes of a futuristic kind, etc., etc. So uh, I think uh, to get the ball rolling, what I'd like to do is uh, turn things over to Mr. Altman and uh, have him say a few words about uh, being here, about what he's uh, involved with, etc. Well, I'm, <clears throat> I'm uh, flattered at all this attention, and uh, I'm gonna keep, I've got people on my back. But, <laughs> um, I, I want to start out by saying that I don't have anything to say, <laughs> but uh, <Stop> right there. <laughs> that's it. So, uh, but so I, I really will take questions and I'll give long answers. But I'm interested in the only I would be interested in knowing what you're interested about, and I will just promise you one thing that I'll try to not to lie, <laughs> and that's excluding personal matters. Of, <laughs> but. Uh, uh, and I'll talk about what you want to hear about and try to tell you the truth about it as I see it, which doesn't mean very much. Upstairs is a retrospective. Um, there are a few titles that are not included. I'm wondering if somewhere, sometime, there has been a complete film festival, even with, maybe with some of the television work as well. Anything bigger than this? In other words? Well, I don't know any of any retrospective that has been done. There's been a few of them. They had, they did them in, in Cinematheque in Los Angeles this year, and, but I've never seen this many films shown in one, in one time. And what are there, 16 films? It's kind of interesting in that they're sort of grouped together, almost at random, and seeing them successively must be kind of an interesting <laughs> And occasionally these things, these films work their way up to obscure uh, uh, cable channels, but uh, uh, some of them have, have never gone to video to uh, video cassette, and uh, they look different on television than they do you know, projected. How were they, did they? I didn't see any of the of them. Were the prints okay? Uh, I saw a print in Nashville in California in December in a situation quite like this, and it was just a dreadful print. Popeye was crashed or not. Was it? Just to finish up on this line, uh, if you had a chance to just pop into one of the theaters for any of the titles, which one might you choose to take a look at again, and for what reason? Well, I'm not going to fall into that trap. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, uh, I, I can't make these favorite separations and all. Mainly the ones I think that, that most people aren't aware of. I mean, uh, this film, O.C. and Stakes, we made in Arizona not too long ago. What? How many years? 88? No, no. 10 or 86 or something like that. But six where is this? No, this was before that, 85. Uh, anyway, that film, I think, was virtually unreleased because it was a... I set out to make sort of a uh, my answer to the teenage exploitation films. I call it an, uh, an adult exploitation film. <laughs> but uh, when it was finished and they saw it, they took it to some Canoga Park or someplace and had a bunch of kids look at it and they, they didn't like it. <laughs> so that was the end of the film. And. Um, but I thought it was a very funny film. I kind of liked it. We certainly had a good time making it. Let me ask you a question about uh, the design of the sound, the use of music. I was very struck uh, in Vincent and Theo 
with the adroit handling of sound and music uh, along with the editing. And if you could uh, tell us a bit about some of the thinking behind uh, your strategies in Vincent and Theo in regard to sound, uh, that, that would be useful to a lot of us. Well, I'll, I'll go back to the whole sound uh, issue, and I'll use the same construction that I used in, in Vincent and Theo, where we started out with the auction of the sunflowers for $52 million and, and uh, then uh, went into our picture. Last Saturday night, the Audio Engineer Society, that's all the sound men in Hollywood who do the sound work, the mixers and all that, awarded me, gave me their Lifetime Achievement Award. Uh, it's the first time they've ever given it to a filmmaker. It's always before gone to Dolby or somebody who invented something, or they're very technical. Uh, the same, I wasn't able to, to I was shooting in, in New York on a project and I wasn't able to be there for it uh, but as I it was a, I was very I felt very good about getting this award and I was very proud of it and I also read a the same day uh, a review of Vincent and Theo in a um, Toledo or Tulsa uh, paper I'm not sure about it and, and the Tulsa whatever the review was says, the soundtrack is so bad on this, as in all Altman films, <laughs> that it is, under, it, 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 you cannot understand anything, and it's like all the characters were played by Mumbles and Dick Tracy. <laughs> so I'm getting this uh, Lifetime Achievement Award for my expertise in sound, and at the same time I've got a critic, and I've had many people come up to me specifically about Vincent and Theo, and said, I couldn't understand it. Now. <clears throat> with that the way I don't want you to understand it all I mean it's not television and I, what I'm trying to do and I think that this is what these engineers understood which pleased me I'm trying to present something to an audience in these films in a situation where they have to work a little bit the audience has to invest something uh, you don't hear everything everybody says. In the first place, you know what they're going to say, and usually you don't listen to them in a, in a discussion. You're thinking of what you're going to say. And I'm just trying to present that sense of, that illusion of reality on the screen, as you see in the film, so suddenly the, I can get the audience to, to become involved and somehow call up their own memories of uh, uh, how things are. So it, it, a lot of this bad sound is by design. <laughs> I got fired <clears throat> and Jack Warner, <clears throat> one of the first features I did was a film called Countdown. And Jack Warner, who ran that studio, was much against me coming in and doing that picture, but he, he let, let it happen and he went away to the south of France or for some something for a while. And, he came back the night I'd finished the film and he spent the weekend looking at a lot of the dailies. And I got a call Sunday night at home saying, don't come into the studio Monday because the guard won't let me in. I have been fired and I have been locked out of the studio. And Jack Warner looked at that footage and said, that fool has actors talking at the same time. <laughs> and I, I went out to the studio to the gate where they have, you know, they have policemen on those things. I don't know whether it's to keep people out or in. <laughs> they gave me a cardboard box that had all of the things that were in my desk, and so that was that. Was that. But uh, th that's exactly what I'm trying to do, and a lot of people don't like it. And I, I can't... So that means I did, haven't succeeded. But the philosophy is the same, of trying to give the audience the same, same way with what you show them. You don't show them everything. It's to so that the audience can can use their own information, what's in their own computers, and put experiences and things together and say, oh, and suddenly then you're emotionally involved. And you can be involved in that, uh, what I'm trying to say. So that's the, the whole sound philosophy. I started on a film called California Split. Uh, we shot in 74. 
and it was the first time I used 8-track. And I just, I said, well, they do this in sound recording, in music recording, they put a microphone on every different instrument, they try to isolate them as much as possible, and they mix them afterwards. I said, why don't we do that with the voices? Why don't we do the same thing? So we actually had invented for us 8-track tape machines, and we started with individual microphones, and I've been doing, I've used, every film I've made since then have, has, I've used an 8-track system. Uh, which means unmixing on the set and then mixing later. So that if if he's overlapping me and I want you to hear me, I can take his sound down and mine out. Uh, but nobody else has ever done it to this day. There, there well, have been they do six tracks. Yeah, they do yes, here, generally. Uh, Spielberg and Coco. Uh, and uh, I try generally not to have a, what I call a conventional back underscore. There's some films that say, no, I want an underscore. I want a score that, that... But even when I do that, like in Vincent and Theo, I try not to do a score that necessarily is sympathetic with what's happening on the screen, but it is uh, the antithesis of that. Uh, in Vincent and Theo, I... I uh, Gabrielle Yared, who uh, I'd worked with on uh, Beyond Therapy, uh, he's a French, he's a Lebanese, he's a French composer, works in France. Uh, I said, I want this to sh this music to show the inner turmoil that's going on in Vincent's mind and not necessarily what you're seeing on the screen. So, so we had, and then the romantic kind of those vile to go against what was happening. It works brilliantly. Yeah, I'm very happy with this work. Question well, yeah, at one time you said in McCabe and Mrs. Miller that, you know, you made the film and it was in the can and you really hadn't decided on the music yet. And then later you decided on the Cohen <laughs> score. Yeah, I had on the plays fiddle. I got a, one of those old uh, uh, metal mechanical Nickelodeon. music box, Nickelodeons that they used and when I put in that whorehouse. We used that music. and But I never knew what I was going to use. And... I finished the picture and I went to Paris and was just uh, in, in a party one night in somebody's apartment and suddenly this album, this Leonard Cohen album, came to us on the record player and I heard it. I said, my God, that's my movie. And I called my editor, Louis Lombardo, who's a Kansas City guy also, uh, and uh, I said, get that album and transfer it to film and I'm coming back and I, we were doing this in Vancouver and I went back and it just, Leonard's, those songs just fit that picture like they were a glove. And the, then I realized what had happened is those songs were in my mind so uh, deeply. And when I shot that picture, uh, it, I just, I was using that and, and unconsciously. So when I put, the, put them together, it was, it was, they just worked great, we all felt. <laughs> Who didn't do it? <laughs> so, but the bad thing was the studio said, oh, well, you can't use that because that's Columbia and we're Warner Brothers. And so we'll get uh, James uh, Taylor to do a song for you. I said, no, no. I said, I'm going to use these. They said, we can't get them. We can't get I So I chased Leonard Cohen down. I found him in Nashville and uh, got him on the phone. And I said, uh, I mean, this doesn't have to happen. And then they ended. I, I think that uh, film, in the same way with the books, writing, if you read it again, it can take on a whole new experience. Yeah, hold on. Uh, yes. In Vincent Theo, uh, in the end of the film, Vincent writes on the wall, I am the Holy Spirit. I am the whole spirit. And, um, and then toward, uh, toward the end, Marguerite Taché makes hope, which he refuses. She slams the door in his face. <clears throat> I was just wondering, do uh, you see uh, Vincent at that point becoming uh, kind of a monk, totally dedicated to art, or is this an indication of his uh, art? Well, uh, specifically in that case, I think that uh, <coughs> Vincent mutilated his ear to take the self-mutilation. I think that was a cry for help, a cry for attention. It was the kind that he could 
there's no other reason that you would do that. Pay attention. Uh, when he, then he, he went into the uh, San Rene for a year and put himself in an asylum. And uh, he came out with Marguerite Gachet, over there, Dr. Gachet.
Do you remember me? I do, but I don't know from where. I was your waiter. Tommy's rocking. People and directing people and all of the people out there. She's attending uh, some. Uh, well, I, I say that in a nice way. I'm just making it nice. <laughs> She'll be back soon with the report and uh, bringing us some news about a new movie coming to town. As an actor, uh, I would love to have worked for somebody like Bob Alden, Robert Alden, and I, I did have that opportunity, but I never had a chance to work with a director. There are a lot of people responsible for this great event, and I, I really hope I don't forget anybody. I sat there writing every name that I could remember. Naturally, everybody had a part in it, but there were some who had a bigger part than others. And I'm going to just read some names who deserve your hearty applause. And if you'll wait till I've read them all, I would appreciate your joining me and giving them a round of applause for this, for all the hard work they've done in putting on the first Greater Kansas City Film Commission. It really is. Uh, Captain Rutschy, come on up, too. Yeah. stage a little bit. We really are most appreciative that you're here. We hope you feel the warmth and friendship and hospitality of the community that you knew so well at one time. We hope that you recognize how much we appreciate your talent, and we do hope that we'll see you back here soon again. But in any event, this has all the privileges of being an honorary citizen and no tax consequences, so please come. <laughs> Looking at the key, wondering about its small size, we are on a tight budget. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Mayor. Thank you, everybody. I, I'm overwhelmed and, and uh, very moved by uh, all of this. How, how late is this good? <laughs> uh, okay, well, I, I'll make this short then so I can go use the key. Uh, but I, I, everybody's been very generous and uh, I've seen faces I haven't seen in 40 years, and sometimes I, I, I even recognize the people behind the faces. And uh, it's, uh, as I say, people ask me, oh, do I, what's Kansas, coming from Kansas City, how does it affect my life, my films? Well, it is, it is me. Uh, this is all my formative chips were made, laid down here. I grew up on these streets and uh, with these people and faces, and voices, and attitudes, and culture, and a culture, the whole thing. And so anything that I do in, in my life, in my art, uh, uh, can only reflect me, and I'm a result of this. So I thank you, and I thank this city. If you have a problem about next year, you can call me back. I got <laughs> In um, just a few minutes, here we're going to uh, with uh, the man that was responsible for MASH and McCabe and Mrs. Miller in Nashville, uh, and so many films that after we're all dust, people will be looking at them and they'll be laughing and crying and scratching their head. But to think that we can do anything to honor you any further is almost absurd. But regardless of that, in recognition of your outstanding contributions to filmmaking. Uh, we'd like to present you with the first Achievement Award from the Greater Kansas City Film Commission. Thank you very much for coming. Again, we thank everybody for their generous contributions, for their help, for making this evening a success, for making the whole film festival a success. Uh, we can only reiterate, we will have a film festival again next year. 
We will have more time. In the, in the rain. Happy birthday, yeah. yeah. So what are you Whenever you're ready. Testing, one, two, three. Okay, why don't you place this in a context for us? We might, for example, expect to see you at Cannes, or at the New York Film Festival, or in Chicago. What's going on here? Well, I've, I've been to all those places many times, and uh, this is the first time I've ever been to the Kansas City Film Festival, because I think this is the first Kansas City Film Festival. So there really isn't any truth to that business about a prophet has no honor in his native land, huh? Well, he's, has, he's not very well recognized, except everybody's been very nice to me here. I think they don't believe it's really me. I have, I have the key to the city, and I'm going to go out and use it. Now. Figure out what it fits. Yeah. Tell me a little bit about uh, what something like this means, though, to come back to one's hometown. Is there a special edge to any kind of recognition like that? Well, it makes me want to cry. <laughs> No, it's very, it's very moving. I mean, I, you know, it, it, it conjures up all of the, the, uh, my basic chip thoughts that uh, when I grew up, everything I know came from, you know, those first 20 years I was here. A lot of people might be wondering, how does an international filmmaker have roots in a Midwestern town like Kansas City? But there was a very special company you worked for. I worked for the Calvin Company here and learned a lot of my tools, but everybody's got to have roots someplace. Now, Vincent and Theo is very big right now. What does a film like this mean for you in terms of future projects as a filmmaker? Well, I don't think it means much about future projects, but what about, let's talk about that project in itself. The very fact that that's been very successfully received is, uh, that's what I do it for. Look, I made this, and people like it, and I love it. <laughs> Finally, let's look back over a long run now of films. Some have made it, some are still relatively obscure. Do you love them all? Oh yeah, very much so. And they've all made it, but some of them people haven't seen. But I have. Is it fair to say that sometimes you've made some films that are looking for an audience and they might be out there waiting? Well, the audience just didn't know about them, but they will one day. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. Thanks, John. Uh, I'll need your card. I want to hear about Joe. Yeah, I didn't even show. All right. I don't know. Encourage me, tell me, tell me that I'm not in my professional, my chosen career. Tell me the future. Uh, sitting. Table next. Oh, they. 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 Oh, they.
she was supposed to take the tape and get them to these people. And I'll dub them and then get them over again. Well, why don't you dub them? If you want to, you can get them to me, I'll get them to you. John Tim is good. VHS copies of it. Greater resolution, but uh, it's well. This is the BV, BVP 50, which has got the frame interline chip in it, which means nothing to most people except you can shoot into a bright light or the sun and you don't get a vertical smear like you do with the other chips.